So I am super excited to chat with Nicholas Pinot as we are going to be chatting about EMF hazards and of course tying them into thyroid health and going to be an awesome conversation here. So let me go and dive into Nick's impressive bio. So Nick, the EMF guy, Pino is the number one best-selling author of the non-tinfoil guide to EMFs and an advocate for safe technologies. Through his unconventional approach, blending humor, science, and common sense, he's become a leader, leading voice on the topic of electromagnetic pollution and how it affects our health. For the last few years, Nick has been interviewing some of the best minds on health and technology and facilitating the creation of courses and educational materials to raise awareness on this very important issue. And you can find more about Nick at the emfguide.com. And thank you so much for joining us, Nick. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, this is a fascinating topic and something that affects everyone, of course. And I want to start a little bit with your background. So how did you start focusing on helping others becoming more aware of the problem with electronic pollution? My my journey started in 2010 when I got into nutrition, but quickly, you know, diverged into environmental toxins because yes, I discovered that many people can argue online about what is the best diet, but we can all agree that if you add glyphosate or you know, other pesticides, herbicides, or heavy metals in your food, that's nothing good. And also some people realize by then that uh, there's plenty of scientific research that shows we're impacted by these toxins at very low levels. And we're, it, it also showed me and made me a little bit blase about the current state of regulatory agencies. I realized that, you know, these substances are not properly regulated in a, in a sense that the public is not completely protected against these health hazards, especially when they are cumulative and then act in sy synergy. And another toxin I came across later in my career as a citizen journalist is electro pollution. And that was new for me because I had heard a little bit about, you know, the dangers of putting a phone to your head and maybe the risks of brain tumor. But I had no idea that hundreds of independent scientists and some of them very prestigious uh, had very pre prestigious careers in other types of pollution uh, and these hundreds of scientists were pretty much saying the same thing we need more research we're underfunded and and systematically defunded in fact so the more you find negative health effects uh, linking cell phones and uh, and you know poor health, the less you get funding, which should it should have been the opposite, where you know urgent funding, additional funding from the government or uh, health agencies. So I was very alarmed by the fact that we should be studying this technology more, and we're doing it less and less. And at the same time, we are increasing our exposure. And this led me to, led me to write my book in 2017, the Non Tin Foil Guide to EMFs, and. I really choose, chose that title and that angle because I realized, my God, in among many skeptics that uh, e even those in functional medicine that understand environmental toxins, a lot of them did not take EMF seriously. And part of the reason is there's a lot of confusion online. Some of it is straight up incorrect. Uh, a lot of it is fear mongering. But then you, you got this opposite side of the coin that is, oh, there's no effect. This is non-ionizing radiation. It does nothing to the human body. It will not interfere with your sleep. It will not give you a brain tumor. There's nothing to see here. And I think these two positions that are at the extremes are completely incorrect. And I tried to make sense of, okay, what are the scientists actually saying? What can we safely say about these dangers and how do we communicate them? And there's not a lot of certainty around EMS. People are looking for certainty. How dangerous are these, Nick? How long should I use my phone safely, right? Uh, what is the difference between cell phones and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and these kind of exposures? And the topic is very complicated to communicate on a scientific basis because these most of these questions are left unanswered to this day uh, due to the lack of funding and then the systematic defunding of the entire topic. Yeah, thank you for explaining that and giving that background. And yeah, I, I I think more 
people, including practitioners, are becoming more open to EMFs. I mean, still, mm -hmm. we have a long way to go. Now, you mentioned br brain tumor, which I, I think it's safe to say you probably would agree that probably in most people, EMFs aren't going to cause brain tumors. They could do that potentially, but it goes beyond that. It's like some people might hear brain tumor and just like dismiss it. But it, I, I actually listened to some of your past interviews and just talking about some of the effects like even sleep disruption, even if that alone was you know, caught, was a problem, which I think it is. Uh, you know, that that alone could be a big reason to try to minimize our exposure, uh, conditions like tinnitus. So, so yeah, if you could talk a little bit about, uh, I guess before we do that, for those who are brand new to EMFs, can you maybe first just talk about what EMFs are, and then maybe we lead into the conversation of maybe some of the concerns like p potentially cancer, sleep disruption, and some of the other sure. concerns? Sure. So there are many different types of, of EMFs. Of course, the, the electromagnetic spectrum is very large. It encompasses everything from the Schumann resonance, which is the natural magnetism uh, emitted by the planet Earth, which we actually need on a biological standpoint, up to you know microwave radiation, which is your cell phone. And we also have visible light. And then we go at the extreme in nuclear radiation. All of these exposures have different dosage that are compatible with the body. but one thing is is generally true is that natural exposures tend to be more compatible with our biology. So the sun, visible light, right? The, we do have, you know, a certain dose of sunlight that we can get safely and then we can get risks or even, you know, skin burning and, and other things that aren't pleasant at all if we get too much sun. But it's it's understood that these exposures are not only beneficial, they are in fact needed for good health. Uh, and now with the vitamin D research that's exploding in the last decades, it shows us that our health is, is intertwined with the sun cycle, just on a circadian rhythm standpoint, but also vitamin D protection and overall immunity. And um, researchers think of vitamin D as a hormone now and, and not even as a vitamin per se. So it's even more profound than that. So we're closely linked with natural EMFs. And there's all the reasons to think that if you tamper with the EMF environment by creating new EMFs in the form of cell phones, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cell phone towers, smart meters, everything that emits these signals that were essentially never seen in nature in, in these forms, these intensities and these specific frequencies, then you might get into trouble. And the entire topic of, of EMF needs to be understood in um, by understanding first that we are bioelectrical being. There's many components of our bodies that need electricity or produce electricity or have sensors that read electricity around the cell or around the mitochondria. And if we understand that and we recognize that we are bioelectrical beings, it makes it at least plausible that if you have a bunch of different random signals around you, that might create confusion on these bioelectrical sensors of the human body. So we're really talking about electromagnetic bio interference, which is not a topic that is often discussed. Engineers are very well aware of electromagnetic interference. And if your cell phone and your neighbor's cell phone talk to each other and it causes disruption and you both drop the call or you hear each other when you shouldn't, well, engineers are going to step in there and say, my God, there's something unacceptable going on. We have poor connectivity or we have crosstalk. We're going to solve it. But in the case of bio interference, not so much because our safety guidelines are simply based on the wrong assumptions. And these engineers do not have the obligation to minimize the amount of radiation that their devices emit. To the contrary, at the moment, it's, it's almost anything goes because the, uh, the threshold levels of EMFs that are accepted, especially in the US, Canada, Australia, and most of the Western nations, is so permissive that these engineers go for the maximum amount of emissions. The maximum, wh why would they choose that, right? It's not to harm people, it's just for better connectivity. <laughs> and they're not trying to minimize the potential harms or the potential risks. So this is really the, the situation here is we're talking about how to 
uh, more safely use these devices considering that our safety guidelines are anything but safe at the moment. Yeah, those are gr great points. So really, it's again, there is research out there, but they're not paying attention to the research. And, you know, now we have 5G, which is, you know, even more powerful. I don't know if 6G is coming, you know, in the near future. But like you said, they're just looking to, uh, you said it is coming in the yeah, well, you know, it never stops. And the part part of the the discussion we need to have is it's not just what we're exposed to right now. It's what we've been exposed before because previous technologies were not were also unsafe. And many people focus on 5G, uh, they hear 5G and and read things. Oh, 5G is dangerous, but they're reading this this 5G article on the web on their 4G phone and maybe are under the impression that they're doing good. Well, you know, before 5G, way before 5G, I wrote my book in 2017. And way before that, you had scientists in the 1980s emitting concerns over the first Nokia phones, the big bricks. So in reality, this topic has always been prone to controversy. And we need to understand that all past technologies and for the moment, all future versions of that technology will be equally unsafe because we're not basing these safety standards on the right thing, which should be how much disruption are these causing. Instead, they're focused on how much heating are these devices uh, generating on the body, which is the wrong thing to look at. Okay, so so let's talk about how much disruption do they cause, at least according to the you know what you've read and the re, you know your research that you've done. Now, how harmful can they be? Well, they, there's you know vast amount of research on EMFs, and that the thing that is um, very concerning to me is that a lot, a large fraction of the public, including a lot of engineers or intellectuals, think that there's no studies. Uh, I, I've even been told on Facebook uh, comments on, uh, I think it might have been on a post that I do. And of course, the Facebook comment section is not the most intelligent place for discussions, but it just shows you there's a, an electrical engineer that told me, Nick, this, this research you're proposing is BS, right? And in other words, that weren't so uh, kind uh, because they really thought I was, you know, as some sort of a snake, snake oil uh, salesman or a scam artist trying to you know, create some elaborate scheme to extract money out of people by creating fear mongering around EMS. And they said, Nick, there's there are zero studies showing that this radiation is harmful. And I said, my God, that this is this is bizarre, because if you just go on PubMed, you're going to find at least several thousands. And we can say that, you know, some studies show no effect and some do show effects. But at least you can say, to be fair, that it's a mixed kind of literature. But scientists are trying to pull together these studies on different topics, such as, uh, for example, cancer and cell phones. So is there a link between talking on a phone, on the ear, and then different types of cancer of the head and neck, including thyroid cancer, which is uh, increasingly being studied as we speak? Uh, well, it depends on which scientist you're, you ask this question to, but you have groups of scientists, including top epidemiologists that were uh, very, very um, recognized as great epidemiologists, such as uh, Dr. Anthony Miller, who had great success uh, in his scientific career around environmental pollutants. And he said in 2018 that the data we had was sufficient to reclassify this agent called radio frequency radiation. Radio frequency is cell phones, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. He said it should be reclassified as a class one carcinogen. That was seven or now eight years ago. So, um, uh, sorry, six years ago. So six years ago, he said that it should be next to asbestos and cigarette smoking. So if it were reclassified, I think the public perception around these risks would be changed. Because, of course, like you said very uh, perfectly, it's not like the entire population will die of a brain tumor. However, since we have nearly every single human being on the planet that uses a phone, if you change a small fraction of a percentage in brain tumors, you're killing a bunch of people. So the more the, more the population is exposed to an agent, the greater the risks if we get it wrong. Right. So th this is really it's part of the precautionary principle is that if a technology is rolled out to the entire population, 
how much we assess the risk and the quality of our science needs to go way up compared to an agent that is used occasionally or in certain industries, for example. But now we're talking about exposures to every single human being. And even uh, more than that, we're talking about exposures to everything biological on the planet since we're rolling out these cell towers and now global satellites around the planet, which is, you know, another rabbit hole. But as far as the what kind of science do we have besides uh, cancer? Well, there's good reasons to think that our fertility is is impaired by these things. So not only it might, might it affect the thyroid hormones, but also if you have a phone in your pocket, you might impact, you know, how much your uh, for example, the, the testes will be produ uh, pr producing testosterone. Uh, that plus maybe the quality of sperm can go down. And it's still being uh, argued by different scientists, but some of them are quite convinced that there's a direct link between keeping a phone in the pocket and a reduction in fertility and testosterone. So there are men out there that always laugh at this. They say, oh, perfect. I don't want any more kids, but they do want their testosterone and they want their longevity as well. So don't uh, disregard these risks. And as far as the thyroid goes, there are links between even just the, the presence of cell towers and thyroid dysfunction in certain studies. Uh, one of them found that uh, you're more likely to get hypothyroidism, which is very rampant these days, as I'm sure you, you're talking about all the time. Uh, if you live within 300 feet, 100 meters of a cell phone base station, the problem is that these days it's becoming extremely likely that if you live in a city, you will be within this distance of a cell phone station because they're everywhere. And now with 5G, one of the, the big problems with 5G is the proximity of these antennas to the population. And even if you turn off your own phone, well, if you're exposed to the cell towers, you might get these these uh, negative health effects as well. So there are a lot of reasons to also think. I, I was just looking at a review from 2019 uh, that is called The Possible Global Hazard of Cell Phone Radiation on Thyroid Cells and Hormones. And they said that uh, more research is needed. It tends to be in every study you find on EMFs these days. More research is needed. It's slow, it's tedious, and I think that most of these lines of research will take a few decades to become strong enough and with enough studies of high quality and independent studies that, that we have a conclusion. However, the researchers already said that, you know, we think exposure by cell phones may negatively influence the iodine uptake, uh, iodine uptake in the thyroid gland or increases temperature effect on the thyroid gland. They also said that the reduction in diameter of thyroid follicles uh, is potentially linked with cell phone radiation. So many of these researchers, they, they don't talk about public policy. They don't, you know, comment on, does it mean cell phones are safe or unsafe? They just put the research out there and they hope that WHO or a large governmental body uh, will pick up these studies and do something with it. it. But many of them recommend against holding a phone to the head. And it's interesting because, you know, this is not what we hear from governments at all. Uh, one of the only governments in the world that has been forced by the, its uh, Supreme Court to communicate these dangers is uh, the Italian government a few years ago. And that was over after the Supreme Court found that a man was killed by a brain tumor that, and they found causality between the tumor and a cell phone. And they said, they, they slapped the wrist of the government saying, you need, you will be forced by your own justice to communicate these risks to the population and at least let them know, you know, you can use your phone more safely. If you talk on speakerphone or if you use headphones instead of putting it right next to your thyroid and, and parotid gland and, you know, uh, auditory nerves and, and all these delicate structures around your head and neck, if you don't do that, then you're avoiding most of the risks. So right there, you have many scientists and that study the topic argue well, why aren't we erring on the side of safety while we're waiting for these studies to become conclusive? And what I see online and what I see from skeptics is, no, I want a definitive proof of harm and then I'll do something. 
this is backwards thinking. It doesn't work in public policy. And we've done that plenty uh, with different agents where agents are rolled out and we say, oh, you know, lead is, we don't see big dangers with lead. And then 10 years later, we say, oh, well, we think that we're overexposed. And each 10 year, the level of lead that is considered safe, it goes down. And eventually, I think most scientists agree that there is essentially no level of lead that is acceptable in the body. And yet we do have occasional exposure. So the, the same with cell phone radiation, we're really far from that because instead of preventatively lowering exposures from phones and maybe putting the cell phone towers a little bit further away from the population in case that the, these effects exist, we're doing the opposite, bringing the cell towers to the population, making the phone stronger. So it's really where we're doing it massively wrong with this entire story of health effects. Yeah, that was a great analogy with lead and like you said, other agents in the past. And as you mentioned, why not just err on the side of caution and be safe rather than take the risk, even if it is controversial, but it's just, like you said, backwards thinking. And so it could affect thyroid hormones. It could affect fertility, including testosterone, potentially also cause thyroid cancer. Is, is there any evidence that EMFs can play a role in autoimmunity, like compromise the immune system and increase susceptibility? There are several papers showing different effects on immunity. And it's, um, it's difficult because in many situations, certain exposures, when you're studying, especially when you're studying mice uh, or rats, so in animal models, or even just cell cultures, you find at certain exposure levels, you find effects such as increasing immunity. And then you find other effects that in certain other conditions, it will be a decrease in immunity. So it looks like in certain situations, we can adapt to the exposure and maybe even the stress of this radio frequency could make us stronger, act like a sort of hormetic stressor, just like heat exposure or cold plunges or exercise. But in other situations, when it's chronic exposure, you see a depression, a, a, a very, you know, a, a down regulation of the immune system at many levels. So as far as autoimmunity, there's not a lot of evidence, but we have certain researchers such as uh, Dr. Trevor uh, Marshall, uh, who is um, a professor in California uh, of the, um, I think it's Autoimmunity Research Foundation, if I recall correctly. Uh, and he said, he basically ran a study with uh, participants that had various um, conditions that are autoimmune, including, uh, you know, lupus and uh, maybe other uh, autoimmune conditions. I'm not familiar with all of them. And he basically shielded them against this electro smog at night. And he realized that 90% of them said that they slept much better and started seeing their symptoms of different autoimmune conditions go down. So he concluded uh, himself, he said, this is bizarre because if we believe the statistics, there should be around three to 5% of individuals that are electrosensitive and that might be helped by these shielding strategies. So it makes it, uh, it, it makes it, you know, it makes the case that people with autoimmunity are that much more likely to be electrosensitive and feel these effects. And also he said that in the future, a com an important component of uh, an autoimmune protocol to get people better would be to shield against these external radiation stressors. Uh, so that's something very radical to say, but you know, he's been studying the topic for I think over a decade now, uh, and he's considered an expert in autoimmunity. Uh, I don't think you know many of his colleagues would necessarily agree because that's almost you know a fringe topic to study, but I think it makes sense and. And anecdotally, um, there are many, many functional medicine doctors that I connect with on a regular basis that see these patients come in and they're, you know, they're impacted, they're affected by multiple things. Sometimes they have autoimmune conditions. Some of them have multiple infections. They have low thyroid, hyperthyroid. It's sometimes, you know, they have 10 different things going on, but one of them that holds true for all patients is that when they start reducing EMF exposure, everything seems to work better. So is it because you're improving sleep and therefore overall healing? 
it might be one thing. It might be because you're decreasing stress. It might be, there are different reasons, but it looks like EMF can worsen almost any condition out there. Just like eating a diet of McDonald's uh, or Wendy's will also do the same, you know? So in that sense, these man-made EMFs are almost the, the junk food of signals or, or frequencies, if you will. Did I hear you correctly? Did you say three to 5% of people are electrosensitive? Well, it depends. Again, different scientists will have different assessments, but I'd say that 3% is very common among scientists that say 3% are hypersensitive. That would be those who have a very hard time with EMFs. And normally these people can pinpoint that certain exposures are causing them massive symptoms, uh, almost like you know a celiac person that knows they're celiac and eats bread, they can pinpoint, I ate that bread and now I feel horrible for days on end. So the same thing can be said for about one to 3%, some say three to five, but also other scientists say there might be a third of the population that has mild to moderate symptoms, including, including a reduction in sleep, or maybe they feel more depressed. They have a different neural psychiatric effects such as anxiety, depression, uh, OCD type behavior. And um, that might be a third of all adults, but other researchers have predicted that by 2017, that's something I, uh, I talked about uh, in my uh, 2024 summit on electrosensitivity. By 2017, these two researchers on electrosensitivity had predicted that 50% of the population would be sensitive based on the last studies, all the surveys they did in different countries. And the curve was going up and up like, a, you know, in a, in a hockey stick kind of a graphic there. So they predicted, they asked the question in 2006, they said, will we all become electrosensitive and be sickened by this technology? And I don't know the answer to that. However, many doctors and even averagely people that are fairly healthy change their habits around technology and start feeling better. So there's this difficulty to assess how much EMF is is contributing to my own health challenges or even just to is preventing me from reaching my full potential. If I feel very well right now, do I feel 80% in reality of what, uh, you know, I'm missing this extra training 20% because of these exposures. And if you cut down on EMF, turn off Wi-Fi at night, turn off your phone, some of them realize I sleep much better. I thought, you know, I had reached the peak of my health, but it turns out that some of these gadgets around me were keep me, keeping me down, and now I have my full potential. The same thing is uh, seen in many professional hat athletes that know about the topic. So I think increasingly they're going to be interested in, in the topic, although it's tough because some of them are using sensors and a lot of EMF things to, you know, to perform better. So it's all a balance, I guess, of especially, you know, not necessarily having these things with you at night, but... Um, I think I think that in the future we'll see we'll see EMF being you know part of the discussion about the factors that we need to at least control in our environment. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned turning off devices before going to bed because if, if someone's having sleep issues, that's something I definitely bring up. I mean, we're so quick to take supplements like melatonin and you know other supplements to help with sleep, but a, a lot of people overlook the impact of going on the computer an hour before going to bed or on their cell phone and keeping their Wi-Fi plugged in at night. So those are simple changes, just unplugging the Wi-Fi every night or having a switch, like a timer, just to automatically turn it off and turn yes. it back on in the morning. And then how would you say like, ideally, I guess you probably would say maybe like a couple of hours before going to bed, like people should stop being on devices in a perfect world. I know it's not a perfect world, but maybe like two hours or. Yeah. Well, you know, there are, there are many aspects to this. Not only is, uh, is radio frequency radiation. So the, the, you know, the radiation that connects your phone to a cell tower, not only is this impacting your melatonin possibly and, and shifting your brain waves in a way that is not conductive to great sleep. In fact, it, it will cause sleep onset uh, delay. So you're you're trying to go to sleep, but you toss and turn and your, your brain is not really going in the right 
type of brain waves that it needs to go into in order to fall into your your first sleep cycle and go into deep sleep and REM and and light and kind of you know cycle through these different cycles throughout the night. So I would say not only is is radio frequency a problem, but also the light, the visible EMFs that are emitted by devices. So I would say two hour before bed is good, but I personally advocate for the uh, the use of you know blue blocking glasses that can help mitigate some of the problem with light. And then in, in the scope of my work, especially during sleep is when you want to absolutely make sure that your cell phone is not, you know, emitting 4G, LTE, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all these signals under your pillow. And the reality is, you know, you have 75% of the population in some studies that have a cell phone near their pillow. And the those that use airplane mode in one study I saw uh, from a few years ago was 20%. So it's still, you know, it's still not a, not that popular. I guess two out of 10 people made me a little bit happy, I must say, because uh, I thought it, it might've been, you know, 3% of people or something like that. Something very, uh, very depressing to be honest, but 20% is not enough because we know that it can impact sleep. And then we also know that for some people, it's not just a small impact on sleep. It might be a huge impact. And there are genetic uh, differences and there are also health status differences in different people. So it looks like the stability of your bioelectrical system is also will change with your, or your overall health. And that's just, you know, an overall systems thinking perspective here where if you're in better health, you're, you're better able to handle occasional things that make you weak, such as alcohol or junk food. And maybe you drink a night, one night and maybe the next day you're fine to go jogging. Whereas someone in extremely poor health or chronic fatigue might do one workout or have one glass of wine and feel very, very fatigued from that same exposure. The same looks like it's true for for EMF. So your ability to handle the radiation might be way better if your overall health is better. Uh, but so th th that's another reason if you already have autoimmune issues or thyroid issues, you know, you should be more motivated to turn off the EMFs under your pillow. And one thing you could do is just charge your phone in the next room. And I know a lot of parents use their phone as their emergency line for their kids. Maybe they, they get, they're they getting older. They're going out at night for the first time. They don't feel good about, you know, turning off the phone at night. They never listen to me. So I tell them, okay, that, that's fair. But just put it, you know, in the bathroom or on a kitchen table. Somewhere you'll you'll still hear it. But make sure that it's not right next to the pillow. You shouldn't be able to reach out to your phone. And uh, it is just a distraction. And also the radiation it emits will uh, negatively impact your sleep as well. All the concerns, you, you mentioned airplane mode, like 20% in that study put in airplane. So if it is in airplane mode and if it's still nearby within arm's reach, is there still concern of some radiation? It's more complicated than that, unfortunately. You can be on airplane mode and you can still have Wi-Fi on. Uh, so you need to not only be on airplane mode, which turns off the cellular antenna, which is the one that connects the towers, but also make sure to turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So you need to be, you know, aware of these things. And uh, especially if you if you have the phone by your bed stand, but, you know, if some people use um, just basic EMF meters, which can help, you know, double check your work. If you don't know if your phone is emitting or in which under which conditions it is emitting radiation, if you have a meter that screams, <laughs> uh, it shows you, okay, that that phone is still emitting a signal. If you have Wi-Fi, it will sound, you know, like a, like almost like a rifle sound, like doo -doo 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 -doo. if you have Bluetooth, you'll hear clicking. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So if you have these sound indications or even visuals in certain meters, that uh, your phone is still emitting, it gives you an indication that you're doing it wrong and you you should you, you know just go in the menu and tur turn everything off. And something I can mention that is not for sleep, but a lot of people work nowadays in front of a computer, including myself. I'm in a new environment today and I do have to use Wi-Fi, but uh, in many situations I'm back home and I use an ethernet cable to connect my computer to the router. 
And that's uh, regardless if you have a Wi-Fi router or a non-Wi-Fi router, uh, which most people don't have these days. The, the reality is that your computer is often much closer to your body and to your thyroid, for that matter, compared to your router. Your router might be in a corner of the home or maybe uh, you know, uh, in the living room next to the TV, or which is often the case. But your computer will emit a fair amount of radiation with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth all day, every day for hours on end as you're working on a computer. So, you know, something that can be extremely positive if you want to re reduce your uh, your cumulative dose of EMFs is to use this these wires to connect your computer. And I know that's a bit of a, some people perceive it as a retrograde idea or, you know, old school, but it's still feasible. And in reality, if you go in businesses, a lot of commercial buildings still use Ethernet cables and it's still a very great technology to use for rapid data transfer and also cybersecurity. Uh, much, much safer on many levels than Wi-Fi. So if you have a home office and, you know, you're you don't like your Wi-Fi and you complain about it. Well, you know, hit the hit two birds with one stone right there and just wire up your internet to your computer and you're going to cut down on radiation and then just have a steady signal that never drops. Yeah, I'm using Ethernet just, I mean, it's not just to avoid the Wi-Fi, uh, to minimize Wi-Fi, but it's also, like you said, I think it's a better signal. It's, it's just more more reliable too. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and so shielding, you mentioned blue blockers and then earlier it's briefly spoke about shielding. So as far as if like you can't get your smart meter removed or again, it's a maybe put over your router. Uh, like, so it does sound like you're a supporter of shielding for EMFs. Yes. It, cutting down on emissions is way more effective than shielding because partial shielding might dampen the signal. For example, uh, an example is something that's sold that you can put over your, your Wi-Fi router, which will dampen the signal 90%. The problem I have with that and the problem scientists have with that is that we currently don't even know what is the safe dose of EMFs. So when you have 90% reduction, is it a 90% reduction in biological effects? Is it a 90% reduction in risks? Not necessarily. Is it better than nothing? Well, likely yes, but I'd rather have people at least, even with that, I would turn off Wi-Fi at night, for example, because when it's turned off, you know you're doing good. When you're starting to go into reduction of EMF, such as you know lower EMF technologies, some of it, I perceive it as EMF washing, just like, you know, green washing is, you know, the perception that your product is healthier for the environment when in reality, you're kind of playing with words. So it's a bit tricky here to, to talk about how much these are contributing to lowering your exposure. But there are shielding strategies that are more advanced that uh, you can successfully use at home, although they require a, a larger investment of time and money, such as shielding the bedroom. And uh, increasingly so, certain environmental medicine doctors are recommending these strategies to their patients where you can completely uh, income, uh, you can completely shield the room either with a bed canopy over the bed that is made uh, oftentimes of a, a cotton and copper or stainless steel or silver mesh. Uh, and these things, it doesn't look like metal. It really looks like fabric that you put over your bed. And it will come, cut down all the exposures that would have come from the outside. And this is especially important in patients that are have this dev level of sickness, such as autoimmune conditions, or have uh, these levels of exposures that are tremendously high because they live too close to cell phone towers, for example, and they don't feel well in their home. Some people really swear by these different strategies that are uh, applied and uh and also verified by building biologists or EMF mitigation specialists. Um, one of these specialists is my colleague, Brian Hoyer from Shielded Healing. And there are plenty of specialists throughout the world that can come to your home and do a survey. And I, I recommend it for almost anyone that can afford it, to be honest, because many people tend to uh, fear the towers so much and say, oh, I'm sure this tower, you know, it's, I, I see it, it's ugly, it's very dangerous, but they don't recognize that 
all the other things that they have installed in, inside their home sometimes can be worse than what the tower emits towards their home. So it's sometimes very difficult to assess uh, what exposure is a priority for you uh, if you don't have the EMF meters and then the expertise to also survey the home for these sources. And what are your thoughts about pendants? There are some, some that have pendants that supposedly protect you from EMFs, which uh, I've been skeptical of, but it'd be great just to put on a pendant. And I'm, I'm sure even they wouldn't say that you're, it's completely going to shield you, but do they have any benefit as, at all in your opinion? You know, some electrosensitivity sufferers seem to do very well on certain of these technologies, but there's a question, does it play on symptoms, a reduction of symptoms, or is it protective? And this is where you don't really see scientists endorsing these uh, these as, as a magic bullet. And I think that many people are looking for a magic bullet that says, you know, ah, ah this is tedious, turning off the Wi-Fi at night or, you know, thinking about the cell phone towers and how much I'm exposed or, you know, this is tedious. Instead, I'll wear something on my person and be completely invincible. This is a nice thought. You know, this is something very that that is very appealing to our psyche, but it, it does sound too good to be true. And it is too good to be true, in my opinion. And so far, I've seen different technologies seem to lower some of the biological effects of EMF, such as, for example, certain technologies you could use in your bedroom to sleep better, even in a high EMF environment. Would that be beneficial? Yes. Are you also supposed to turn off the EMF sources in the first place? Yes. So I think if you do both, you're, you're doing yourself uh, a favor, but if you rely solely on these different stickers on the phone and 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 uh, different pyramids and subtle energy devices, I think you're under the illusion of protection and that uh, it's a dangerous game to play. And really why I, I'm still taking this position is that since we have indications that some people could be killed by this technology, and that's a, a big word to use, but if you get a brain tumor and a glioblastoma and you die from your cell phone exposure, uh, that's something extremely sad. And in many, many cases, this, this has already uh, happened throughout the world. If you are under the illusion that you have a sticker on your phone and you will never get brain cancer from these exposures, and yet in 10 years, you come back to me and say, Nick, you know, I think I'm going to die. I have a brain tumor. I wouldn't feel good about myself because we don't know for sure if it removes any potentially carcinogenic potential of these emissions. We don't know that. So, yes, these gizmos and EMF harmonization devices should be, should be explored, especially for people that are electrohypersensitive. But I've seen none of them offer, you know, uh, the magic bullet that many people are looking for. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And b before we wrap things up, and I definitely want you to talk about your upcoming EMF Hazard Summit, but I, I do want to ask you about aura rings or other devices, because yes. a lot of people use those at night to help them to monitor their sleep and see their sleep quality. And with aura rings, you could like turn off the Bluetooth. But yeah, just I wanted to get your opinion if you think that there's also risk with those. Yes, well, you know, what we know on shifting brain waves is, is concerning to me when you use wearables to track your sleep, but the Bluetooth technology might be impairing your sleep. It's a bit ironic in how these things are designed. However, the Aura, I, it's one of the brands that I appreciate because you can keep it on airplane mode while you sleep. So it will store the data locally inside the ring. And I don't know how, but, you know, the technology is becoming so small, it's almost ridiculous. But, you know, it's just a little bit of data about your heart rate and HRV and uh, body temperature and things like that that are picked up by the sensors. And then in the morning, you can put it out of airplane mode and sync it, sync the data to your phone to visualize it and say, you know, how am I feeling right now? How does it corroborate, corroborate with the data I have and then put it back on airplane mode. So my, my amount of exposure I'm getting from the aura is next to nothing. 
However, a lot of other types of wearables emit Bluetooth sometimes multiple times per second. So I have a problem with that. I don't think it's well designed. And I think that if the technology can be designed in a way that it stores the data locally and it just will dump the data or sync the data once per day or on demand, if it can be done, why aren't all, all types of wearables build this way. And I think it's just poor engineering and I would recommend against it. And, and maybe there are occasions where you want to track your sleep with certain sleep tracking devices that emit Bluetooth and you do it for a month and then you discontinue the use. I, I wouldn't be completely against it, but chronic prolonged exposure would be a problem because I don't think it's going to serve you well. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Nick, for sharing this and all the other information. And before we wrap things up, is there anything else that 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 I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? Anything else that you wanted to summarize? Well, I mean, if we want to summarize how to reduce exposure quickly is just to focus on the bedroom first. And that's really something I remind people is there are really two things we can talk about when it comes to exposures. If you start you know, playing around with a meter and go over every machine, everything emits EMFs. So it's it's hard to think about what is your priority here. Uh, living in the woods, go hide in the cave. It doesn't work really for most people. So in reality, look at what is inside your bedroom and that could be contributing to these exposures at night. And then where are you spending most of your time during the day? For some people at their home office, uh, if it would be my dad, for example, he's a realtor, so it would be his car. He's in the car three hours per day minimum, sometimes more. So for him, it would be maybe turning off the Bluetooth function in the car and you know pre-downloading songs or podcasts on his cell phone. I don't think he's going to do it, but still, I have to keep trying and, and trying to educate him. So really think about where you're spending most of your time and focus there. If you If you start to think about all EMF exposures, it's like being concerned over all toxins. It doesn't work. You have to prioritize. And in that case, just making sure that you, you tackle the bedroom and then where you're spending a lot of time. Uh, I think you're going you're gonna to be 90% of the way there. Well, wonderful advice. Thank you so much for sharing. And where can people find out more about you? Feel free to share your website. And then also, if you could talk about your upcoming EMF Hazard Summit? Sure, tremendous. Uh, so theemfguy.com, so T-H-E-E-M-F-Guy.com uh, -E -E is where people can find me. There's my book, courses, and whatnot. And then uh, the EMF Hazard Summit 2024 will be live from April 11th and 14th. And it is focused this year on the what I call the hidden epidemic of electrosensitivity. So we give people... 20 different talks that are focused on electrosensitivity. We have uh, presidential candidate uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's one of the headliners. We also have environmental medicine doctors that are specialized in treating EMF sensitive patients. So that's very rare that we can find these doctors that have the medical expertise to diagnose electrosensitivity and then that have figured out how can we get these people to a place where they feel better uh, and of course, we should, regardless of if you feel better or not, you should still lower EMFs. But for some people, the level of EMF reduction that they require to feel well is completely unattainable in a city. So they cannot really live in society anymore. And their life choices are, are that much more reduced by their circumstances. So how can they go back to a good health and a good level of sensitivity where they can still travel, they can take a car and go see a friend, or maybe they can spend a few days in a city that they want to visit. So it's really, uh, it's for people that feel electrosensitive or maybe don't know if they are electrosensitive or not. And again, uh, April 11 to 14, and I think you're gonna have links right next to the interview somewhere in your, your newsletters and whatnot. And uh, I'm very happy for this third annual edition. I think it's the best yet, and I can't wait to get your feedback. Yeah, I definitely will include links in the show notes. And yeah, I'm very excited as well. And thank you. Thank you again, Nick, so much, not only for this interview, but for the research that you've done, 
and for the upcoming summit, the past summits you've done, just spreading the awareness. I think it's such an important topic. And uh, again, just appreciate everything you do. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and uh, helping spreading the word the way you're doing it. Thank you. Thank you.